Um, I am so excited to be sharing with you today. This conference has been so amazing. Don Cherie, last night, the authority in the, the ministry that took place. I mean, I was like jaw dropped. I mean, it was amazing, so beautiful, the ministry, what God was ministering through her and then in the Holy Spirit, amen? And then Holly, the first night, she is, I felt like, I mean, she had the word of God and was like, poof, 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 poof. you know what I mean? I was like, get me, get me, come on. It was so good. Um, and then Kay, oh my gosh. I, can I just say, I love your pastor's wife. Yes. She is so real and she's so affirming. And, you know, I think she's so vulnerable. And to me, vulnerability is like one of the greatest signs of bravery. And she is so brave. And the way that, that she is paving for you women is quite remarkable. And then Galen, I mean, he has so much wisdom. He is such a spiritual father and just walks in it. I mean, I just love being in your guys' presence. I really do. You have great, great leaders. When I say that, like, we love them, like, we really, really, really do love them. <laughs> My husband adores Dustin. I mean, adores him. Like, I'm like, really, Grant? Like, pay attention to me. Get off your phone. Um, <laughs> he adores him. Is he even in here? No, he's not. Um, but we just love the family so much. And so I'm family here. That's how I feel. I feel like I'm some family here. I have uh, also, like, like Don Cherie, some deep roots in Albuquerque. I used to come here every summer to hang out with my family who lives in Las Lunas and then Gaina and um, just spend a lot of time here, lots and lots of time. And I, I actually had a meal with some of them yesterday. And you guys are famous. Listen, this church is making a mark, not just in Albuquerque, but all over. Um, yes, amen. I even had lunch with my family, and they, were, they said, you know, where, where, where are you at? What's going on? Because they were, some of them were just even passing through. I have a large family. We're Hispanic. We're very tight. Can I get a witness? Um, and like <laughs> Natalie came with me and I was explaining to her, I was like, everyone gives hugs and kisses. I'm not an affectionate person, but when I'm with my family, I am. Because to not be would just be completely rude. We give hugs and kisses when you come. We give hugs and kisses when you leave. Doesn't matter who you are. So anyway, I, what I was saying was, see, this is that kindred spirit with Kay. I know, I'm like, let me take this rabbit trail and then we'll come back. Um, but my family said, oh yeah. Yeah, the Woodwards, they're awesome. They've been there for so long. They, we've known them. We've known their ministry. We've actually been a part of it at some point because they're like, like they might have a singing family, if you know the name Velasquez. Um, and so uh, anyway, I just love them. I love this house. Um, like I mentioned in the testimonies, my husband and I, we are um, in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City, and um, that's where we live and have our being, and uh, we love the church. We aren't just, um, we don't believe the church is something you attend. We believe it's who we are. It, I am the church. That is like one of our mon mantras, like I am the church. I carry this thing with me. And um, like, like Kay mentioned, we get to work a lot with um, the next generation. And um, I shouldn't say next. They're like the now generation of young people. And they're leaders now. And we've been doing that for years. And it's so, so much fun. Um, and so really quick before I get into it, I just want to share. I have... Um, Years ago, since I've been working with young people, I've got to encounter a lot who don't know what they don't know, if you know what I mean. And um, like some of them I would talk to, and it's amazing in this generation that we're living in that many don't even know, like they know of Jesus, but they don't know who he is. Like don't even know the full story of like that he lived perfectly, you know, the, the full story of the cross, that he's coming again, where he is right now, seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Why is he seated? Why isn't he fighting? All that kind of stuff. And so I got really passionate over the years about equipping the saints to just understand the word and then also um, for new believers that they, you know, I'm like, start in John, sweetie. You're going to be okay. Let's just look at John. And, um, and so anyway, uh, I felt like God, 
laid it on my heart to write a little book. And I'm not the most experienced person, and I'll be the first one to tell you I'm not the smartest. But um, God put it on my heart. And so over a course of time, I did. I wrote it. And it's called Believe. And I actually brought a few because Dustin told me to. And um, I just want to say this, you know, real quick why I wrote it. Because a quick story, if that's okay. Can I do that before I get into it? Listen, my first encounter with surrendering to Jesus was miraculous. I know it's not that way for everyone, but I encountered God in such a way that it was undeniable that he was real, that he um, was in my life, and my life would never be the same again. I was like a preteen, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. Um, My parents, my mom really wasn't in the church. I had a praying grandmother, though, who was. And, um, but we went to a service at my grandmother's church. And uh, it was a uh, it was a special service because there was a guest speaker of some sort. And I honestly don't even know what he was talking about, but he called me out. And um, he said, I just love praying for young people, you know, and then he just asked me, he said, hey, can I pray for you? And uh, I have known God. I knew of Jesus. Um, and honestly, I did believe what I had heard, you know, over a course of small time and in and out of the church. And, uh, but he said, can I pray for you? And I just said, sure, you know, why not? And he said, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. And uh, if you just lift up your hands, just as a sign of surrender. And it was odd. I was kind of embarrassed because I was in front of people. But, um, but I trusted God. I did. And so he said, you know, led me in like receiving Jesus and and, in the Holy Spirit. And it was like instantaneous what overcame me. I had never seen anything like it, had any expectation, anything. But I believed what I was saying, even though he was feeding me the words, Jesus, I believe in you. And I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and just give me the fullness of the life. And I literally was overwhelmed with the presence of God, with him. I crumpled to the ground on my knees. I started crying, like not sad tears, like but happy, happy tears. And I even started speaking out in the spirit, and it was unreal. My stepfather at the time, who was there, didn't believe And so he was like, what is going on with her? You know, he's like, what is happening to her? Is she okay? You know, is God hurting her? You know, or whatever. He had no idea. And I just said, I'm fine. I said, I'm good. And then through the tears, I said, I've never felt this before. I sensed something that was so real that I couldn't even have imagined the kind of peace and the joy that overwhelmed me. And it was after that that I realized that that was the foundation. That was the one. That's the thing. It's undeniable. People, I was sitting next to an agnostic on the plane on the way here, and um, he asked me why I believed what I believed, and I told him that story, and he took it in. And he said, well, i got to be honest. There is a little bit of a light in you that's different. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's real. I can't deny that, you know. We can't, and he couldn't argue with it either. And, and he even said, he said, if witnessing is important, that you're a good one. And I said, well, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, uh, and at one point he said, God's going to have to do a miracle before my eyes for me to believe. And I said, well, I think some things happen by chance in life, but I also think that there's a hand of God and there might be a reason for me having sat next to you. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, if a miracle is what you need, I pray a miracle is what you get. But I told him that story. And, you know, I realized that there are two, two little parts that we have. And everything is, you know, I, we have such a small part to play in what God does, the power that he does and has and moves in our life. But we do have two small things. And we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth. We speak it out. And so I wrote that book called Believe. And actually, this morning, I'm going to talk about Jesus. Is that okay? I'm going to talk about Jesus. And um, we are going to talk about the power of believing in him and making some noise about him. 
making some noise about him. The title of the message is called Speaking of Jesus. And when I say speaking of Jesus, I don't mean quietly or in your mind. I mean loudly raising your voice and declaring the victory and the glory of God that you get bold about it. See, I saw all of you guys in here pre-service dancing, okay? And yelling and hooting, hollering. So I know it's in you. I know there's a reserved side to Monica Pankratz, and I can be prim and proper sometimes. Not often, but sometimes. Um, But there is definitely a free and a loud and a vivacious side. And I know that of each and every one of you. Don't we all desire it? When you see those girls going crazy and dancing like, like crazy, aren't you like, God, I wish I could do that. Just like, maybe that's just me. I'm like, I just want that freedom just to be like, mm, yeah, let's do this. It's, it just feels good. It feels good, and it's liberating. And so, listen, if there's ever a service that it is not your time to be that reserved woman and lady in your seat, I am telling you, it is today, okay? Because I might push some buttons, and I might cause you just to, like, get a little bit. <sighs> but you know what? I'm not looking for an emotion, okay? I'm not trying to rile up your emotions, but I am trying to stir up the faith and the spirit of God inside of you. Amen. There is power when we speak of Jesus, when we speak his name all throughout the word, you see there is power in the name of Jesus and not just speaking his name, but speaking about him, speaking about how he is our righteousness and lived perfectly, speaking about the cross, speaking about how he is victoriously in heaven, speaking about him coming again. When you talk about Jesus, suddenly your life It's like, it's so crazy how it just comes into line with his grace and his mercy. Let's pray before we get into it. Father, I thank you this morning. Oh God, that this may be a morning service and pre-lunch and we may be getting kind of hungry, God, but still and satisfy those little tummies for just a little bit longer. Lord, we thank you that this morning that you are going to speak. I know that there's going to be one conversation happening between me and these ladies, but I know that your Holy Spirit is having one in another realm. And Lord, I pray that the ears of their spirit would be open, God, to hear you, Jesus. Lord God, that you would stir a boldness inside of them, God, that they would not leave the same way that they came in. God, but they would leave with a revelation of Jesus. They would leave Lord God, different. They would leave encouraged. They would leave ready to lift their voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus and in just speaking of him. I believe that when we get beyond just thinking about him and just thinking about it, and we go to the point where we're speaking about it, that there is something in the supernatural that is unlocked. And I believe that because there's examples in the Word of God, and the Word of God tells us that. And so here's a couple, real quick. Acts 10, when the Holy Spirit first filled the Gentiles, so the, the non-Jews, um, you know what, what, what was happening? It was, what was going on is that Peter was just talking about Jesus. He was in the middle of talking about Jesus. That's it. He didn't lay hands on him. He didn't... Uh, Condom Shandai on him. He just, he was talking about Jesus. And it says that as he was just talking about him, that the Holy Spirit, just in such a sweet way, filled everyone who was hearing. Isn't that amazing? The power of speaking of Jesus. In Acts 16, we read that Paul and Silas after they had been put in jail, first talking about Jesus, that they were in the jail cell, and they just, it wasn't over for them. It was, they were just getting started. And so they just said, we're not stopping talking about Jesus just because they put us in jail for talking about him. They started to pray and praise their Savior and King loudly, so much so that they were lifting up the praise in the name of Jesus. And then the earth started to, the, he felt the earth shake under his feet. And then the chains came tumbling down. I don't know, it just made sense there. Um, it sounded right. 
But it's true. When we speak of Jesus, when we get beyond, you know, a lot of times it'd be like, hey, I need to pray about that. Yep, need to pray about that. Uh Uh-huh. But, and we think so much about praying about it that we think we've prayed about it, but we actually haven't. You got to speak it out. Get beyond what's in your mind and get some boldness within you. You have authority because of Jesus. He's equipped you. That heart of yours is there to believe, and that mouth of yours is there to speak. That's what it's there for. And there is power in it. In Luke 1, you can read the story of when Mary, um, the angel came to Mary, angel Gabriel, and he gave her news of Jesus. And he told her that Jesus was to come, the son of the most high God was going to be her child in some, you know, respect. And she said, how in the world is this going to happen? Okay. So she was like, okay, I want to believe, but how's this going to happen? And and then the angel told her the power of the most high is going to overshadow you and you're going to conceive the child. And she said, okay. And then the angel did something unique. I think, I think it's unique is he told Mary about his sister. Isn't that amazing? After the word of the Lord came and told her that he said, and Elizabeth, let me me tell you about your sister, your cousin, your friend, Elizabeth. He directed her to his sister. And he said, he told her about like the child that she was to bear. And it said that then the angel left. So he gave her the word, he gave her the promise, talked about Jesus, gave her Jesus is to come. He's going to, the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. And then Elizabeth, I'm going to direct you to her. He, that's where you to go, to a friend, to a girlfriend, to flourish, okay? And uh, so Mary, it says that she hurried, okay? So the angel left, and she was like packing her dry shampoo. She was packing her stuff, and she was like, that's it. I'm not even going to shower. I got to get to Elizabeth, okay? And so dry shampoo is a miracle worker in of itself, Um, sometimes we ask a lot of it though. Let's be honest. We're like, come on, baby. Um, so she packed her stuff quickly and she went to Elizabeth's house. I can just imagine her running hurried. Like, I I don't know what's going on. I don't know how this is going to work out. I really don't understand it all, but I, I know that Jesus is coming. I know that he is coming to me. I know that the word of the Lord has been spoken to me, but I just know I got to get to Elizabeth. And she got to Elizabeth and Elizabeth, I love Elizabeth because she was kind of crazy. It says that when she got to Elizabeth, that Elizabeth, she began to shout, okay? She saw, Mary showed up at her door. I mean, it's like that crazy relative that they open and they're like, ah! Like, they just get so excited, you know? Like, or you see someone in the lobby and you're like, oh my gosh, you're overwhelming. Um, that's Elizabeth. That's how I see Elizabeth. But she, this, this is what Elizabeth did. Is she said this. When Elizabeth saw her, it says this. In a loud voice, she exclaimed. So she was like, ah, yelling at Mary. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is this child that you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She was so excited. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed the Lord that he would fulfill his promises to her. Blessed is she who believes the word of the Lord and that he would fulfill his promises to her. Something amazing happened after Elizabeth had her crazy moment of excitement and she started to shout. Something unlocked in Mary also. When, Mary, when Elizabeth got crazy, Mary started getting excited, you know? She was looking, seeing Elizabeth, and she was getting excited. And the Holy Spirit began to fill her. And she said that she just responded with a song. 
that's when we can read that Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. So this is like a shouting conversation they're having. Have you ever prayed with a friend, like really prayed with a friend? And they're like praying for you. And, and all of a sudden, the shout rises up in you. And you're like, oh, we're going there. Mm-hmm, we're going there. And you just start saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. And you just start saying it loudly. Why? Because there's an encouragement from your sister. Can I tell you, I feel like I'm Elizabeth today. I know I'm loud. I know I'm a little bit crazy, but I am here just to encourage you enough and maybe prod you enough so that you can let out a song of victory and praise in the spirit. Amen. There was a breakthrough in Mary's life and perspective because she's she said, I mean, she probably hadn't even talked to, to God about it after the angel came. I mean, I would have been like, just give me to Elizabeth. I just know I need to get to Elizabeth. You know what I mean? I mean, you're just on your way. But something unlocked in her. This is not a service to be silent. You can tell me amen as much as you want. <laughs> Years ago, um, quick story. Years ago, I was, uh, I, after college, I was living with my mother, and she was um, living alone, and also I had a 10-year-old brother. Um, he's 10 years younger than me, and so I was like 21 years old, something like that, and uh, I was staying there by myself because my mom had gone out of town, and my brother had gone to a friend's house um, a few miles away to have a little sleepover, a little camp out in the backyard, that kind of thing. And, um, and so I was home by myself at the time. Um, I was dating Grant, and um, I, so I was asleep. Three o'clock in the morning comes. I'm not lying. Three o'clock in the morning, and I hear like a, on the door, not like a, just a, like a silent tap, but like a, Okay, three o'clock in the morning, I'm alone, I'm a chick, I'm like, what is happening? And so I do like the crazy kind of wake up. I'm like, bing, you know what I mean? And it, you just, you don't move. I'm like, my feet were straight out. I had the best posture I'd ever had in my life. And I just sat there like, is what I'm hearing real? Is what I'm hearing real? And I was like, trying to like come to, you know? And so I thought, what in the world? Either someone is dying. It sounded to me like someone was banging down the door. So my thought is, okay, either someone's being killed or they're trying to get in to kill me. That was my first thought. And so I was panicked. I mean, I was immediately like hyperventilating, fear, overwhelmed. And so I did what any (laughs) 21-year-old girl does. I called my boyfriend. And so uh, I called Grant. I don't know why. Like that was my first instinct because he couldn't do anything. And um, he's a great man, though. And, uh, and I said, Grant, someone's at my front door. And he was like, no, no. And maybe it's your mom. I said, no, she's out of town. She's not here. She's not at the front door. And he was like, well, maybe. I'm like, no. And so I said, he said, call, call your mom. And at the time, there was home phones still. And so I, um, who still has a home phone in here? God bless. Um, and uh, so anyway, so I picked up the home phone, and I'm, bup, 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 mom. And so I have him on this line, and her on that line. And I'm like, mom, are you here? And she's like, no. And she goes full on into mom mode, because I called her at 3 o'clock in the morning. And, um, and she's like, what's going on? And I was like, somebody is banging down the door. And so I have them, two on the phone like this. And I'm like, wait a minute. I think it might have stopped. All of a sudden, I hear it on this sliding glass door in the backyard. Yeah, I'm getting hot. And so, and so, yeah, tell me about panic. And so, I mean, I, at that point, my heart just jumps out of my chest. I said, oh, my God, he's on the back door. He's on the back door. I'm going to die. And so my mom said, call 911 right now. And so I'm like, beep, 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 Grant, stay on the phone. Him and his father, who is a senior pastor, he's like, Dad and I are on the way. And so I was like, great. Awesome. And so him and, <laughs> and Pastor Kirk are on their way at 3 o'clock in the morning to my house um, to see who's trying to kill me. And, and so I literally, I was so panicked. I got on the phone with the operator. And you know how operators are. Oh, okay. They're like taught not to panic and just to stay calm, which is so annoying. And I said, I'm like, someone is banging down my back door. Someone is here. They're trying to break in, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, okay, mm-hmm, 
okay? I'm like, you are not taking me seriously. Um, Someone is going to kill me. And she said, well, have you asked who it is? I was like, okay, let me tell you something, lady. No, I'm just kidding. I said, no, I haven't asked who it is, okay? Like, someone's trying to kill me, and you want me to be like, um, who is it? (laughs) No, that's not what's coming out of me. And she said, well, I think you should ask who it is. I'm like, woman, if I knew you. And so I just said, okay, okay. And so I, I, was, I was in the upstairs, and I, so in order to ask, I had to come downstairs, but when you got to the bottom of the stairs, it was like there was a room, but the sliding glass door was there, but there was kind of a curtain, and you, so you couldn't see anything. Um, and so I get down to the bottom of the stairs, and I, I have never been challenged to be so brave. Never. Because she's like so kind and just calm, like, just, yeah, go ahead and ask who it is. I'll wait. I'm like, okay, let's do this. But in my mind, I was thinking, all right, Monica. I'm like, this, I'm like Anna from Frozen. I'm like, this is it. I'm ready. Tell me. Mm, mm, mm. And so I said, okay, I'm going to ask who it is. So I get to the bottom of the stairs, and I'm literally just like. <laughs> and I'm thinking, be brave. Have a low voice. Sound strong. <laughs> and so I, I muster up, and I'm going to say, who is it? And I'm thinking I'm going to be like, who is it? That's what I had in my mind. But what came out of that moment, I could have never imagined. I, I would have scared, oh, anyone. I mean, if anyone's ever been here, you know what I'm talking about. What came out of me was like, who is it? Like, <laughs> like all the adrenaline and everything just came out. And I shouted it was crazy. You know, thank God for that operator on the other line who told me to say, who is it? Um, and to make yourself heard. And she's like, just, you know, they'll let them know that you're there. You know, I'm like, yeah, I want them to know I'm here. <laughs> but, you know, it taught me something. Because in spite of fear, I found this, like, inner just fear fierce roar. And I might have sounded crazy. And sometimes that's what boldness sounds like. It sounds crazy. You're like, my life is upside down, but God is faithful. They're like, girl, you crazy? You crazy? Where is he? And you're like, you know what? He's here. He's faithful. And they're like, you are crazy. You are. That's how I felt. You know, I'll tell you the end of the story because it's kind of funny. I say that, I yelled at the top of my lungs, and I'm expecting someone to be like, pop, 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 through the window. <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, like, dive behind the couch, like, oh, you didn't get me! <laughs> but on the other side of that door, I heard, Monica, it's me. It was my little brother. He had to go TT in the middle of the night. And instead of going to the house in his 10-year-old mind, he said, I'm walking home. He was crazy. You know, in our life, bringing bringing it home to us, we don't know what's on the other side of that door sometimes. On the other side of your door, that fear, I mean, the fear that we can let overwhelm us is so heavy. It can weigh us down so, so much. That fear, that sickness, that depression, that abuse, that poverty, that anger, that condemnation, all of it. But you know what? God knows what's on the other side of that door. He knows what you're dealing with. And you know what? You are not alone. And you need to let whatever is knocking on your door know it. Get some mm, mm, mm in your blood. You know what I mean? We are so calm in church sometimes. I am a talker backer because I learned that's how I receive best. That's how I receive. I'm like, yes, I receive that in Jesus' name. I don't care. I know I'm like a little bit Pentecostal in my blood. I got it. I receive that. Mm. You know what I mean? 
I used to do the dances like this. Mm. Mm. It's in me. But hey, that's how I receive. There is power in your voice when you speak it out. There is a reason that that is all through the word of God, that he tells us to speak out, to believe, and then take it a step further and speak and say it out loud. Psalm 68, 11 says, the Lord gives the word of power and the women, hallelujah, who bear and publish the news are a great host. Who is the word of God? Go ahead, you can answer me. Jesus, John 1, 1, he is the word made flesh. The Lord, our heavenly father, has sent forth his word, Jesus, to fill our lives, to cover our lives with his spirit, and the women who bear and publish that news, not the bad news, but the women who bear and they publish that news, They are a force. They are a mighty host. They are a force to be reckoned with in your home, in your city, in your church. Somebody needs to get some crazy in you and get some boldness enough that you're not just like, God, I just know that there's a scripture in here for me somewhere, somewhere. And you need to open that word and speak. Speak it with some boldness. You need to talk about what Jesus has done for you with boldness. Not just what he's going to do, but what he's already done. What he's already completed and done for you. Satan's ploy is to make us so insecure. So insecure that we either cower in silence. And I have been there. I battle that probably more than I do being loud, which you might not imagine because of this moment. Um, But he either wants us to get so insecure that we hide in silence and just say, I can't say anything. You know, there's like just this mental barrier, like I can't speak. Or he wants us to be so insecure that we are totally overcompensating with an unbridled and an unwise tongue. John 10.10 says, and it says the thief, the enemy, comes in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy That's his job. That's his intention. It's very clear. When it comes to your life, when it comes to your voice, he says, I want to steal their voice. Or I want to destroy it. I want to destroy their words of their mouth so that they're destroying themselves, basically, self-imploding. The second part of that scripture, Jesus said, I came, but I came, that they may have and enjoy, enjoy, not just have it, but enjoy it, that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance. In other words, to the full until it just overflows. That's what, it, that's what Jesus came for. When I first started out in ministry, my father-in-law took a chance on me. He wasn't my father-in-law at the time. And he said, I want you to, I don't know why he did this, <laughs> but he, he said to this young girl who didn't have any ministry experience, hey, I want you to lead our junior high youth. And... Um, I just jumped on it. Honestly, I loved the Lord. And at that point, I just, all I wanted was him. And to, if, if I could get my hand into ministry, ah, uh, what a fulfillment. And so I started in youth ministry. I had no idea the spiritual weight that I was coming into. I had no clue. It, it hit me like, like I had known God for myself. But suddenly I had this, these, these young people that God loved, and they were struggling with so many real things, and it just broke, it broke me, and I remember I would um, have these dreams, these reoccurring dreams, and uh, where I would 
see young people, see my young people who are in my youth ministry, and I would see them in places. They would be in dire situations. They would be about to um, be abducted, or they'd be, you know, literally walking on a fence that was too high that they were about to fall off of. And I would be watching them, and I would need to say, hey, no, honey, hold on. Like, speak out for them. And it would feel like I couldn't talk. Like, it was just like, Nothing, nothing. I didn't have a voice box. There wasn't anything coming out, it felt like. I even had moments where it felt like there was a fist in my mouth. Like just in my dream, just thinking, feeling like I I cannot even speak the name of Jesus. Now, you don't have to be like Joseph the dream interpreter to realize that I had some issues. I had some fear going on that I couldn't have, I didn't have the voice I needed to have, that I couldn't say what I needed to say when I needed to say it, that the spirit of God wasn't large enough in me that I could, I could help these young people. I could speak the name of Jesus. I could, I could help them on their walk and their journey. But I realized something after it occurred for a while, it took me a little bit, but I needed to be so full of Jesus that I would live it out and speak it out whether I was afraid or not. And whether I sounded crazy or not, I needed to speak out Jesus. Amen. To me, to me, Jesus, he's not just my sword, but he's my whole armor. He is everything to me. He is everything. Let me, let me show you real quick. Ephesians 6, 10 through 9 talks about that armor of God. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Us women are much stronger than we give ourselves credit. You are strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the evil day comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, you stand Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up that shield of faith and with, with which you can extinguish every and all flaming arrows of the evil, evil one. And take that helmet of salvation and that sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions and at all kinds of prayers and requests. I read this and I think, I see Jesus all over this. Who is the way, the truth, belt, and the life? Jesus. Who has become our righteousness, our breastplate? Jesus. Who is the prince of peace? Jesus. Who is the author and the finisher of our faith? We think we muster up the faith. It's actually, he puts it there. He's the author of it. Jesus. Who is salvation found in? Jesus. Who's the sword that the Spirit yields, the Word of God? Jesus. Do you see the trend? It's not an emotion that you need to raise your voice and to get bold. You need a revelation of Jesus. A revelation of who he is. Somebody needs to start making some noise in your life. Somebody needs to start speaking out the word, speaking out Jesus over your life, reading Jesus, soaking up Jesus, melting into Jesus, thinking about the cross and realizing that he is everything. Amen. If you would turn to Isaiah 43, 4 through 7, one of the best all-time scriptures about Jesus. It's a prophecy of him, but it is so amazing how it describes the great exchange. It says, surely he, Jesus, has borne our griefs, meaning our sicknesses, our weaknesses, our distresses. He has carried our sorrows and our pains of punishment, our punishment. Yet we ignorantly considered him smick, smit, I'm sorry, stricken and smitten and afflicted by God as if with leprosy. And pause real quick. The weight of sin, not just 
some of our little sins, but of sin and curse was upon him. Six trials he walked through that night after he prayed in the garden. The stress he felt so great that he sweat drops of blood. That's scientific, even still happens. When the stress, I mean, we think we know stress. Stress was so great. It was the weight of sin, people. Not just on his body, the weight of sin. We know the weight of sin. Come on. The weight of sin. When we carry it on our own, which we can't even. But when you sin, when you mess up, when you feel like a failure, the weight is so heavy. That shame, oh my God gosh, it's so debilitating. It was all upon him. He was mocked. He walked miles. He bore it on himself. Verse 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. Somebody needs to hear that today. When we read that word, he was scourged in the Bible. It's like, look, it's just one word, like he was scourged. That means he was beat repeatedly with, and flogged with these whips of leather with iron balls. Have you held an iron ball? The weight of it? It was not just, I mean, that's putting it lightly, a bruise. It tore into not just skin, but muscles, internal bleeding. He was bruised for your guilt and your iniquities. The chastisement needful to obtain our peace, that we can walk in readiness to what lies before us, was upon him. And the stripes that wounded him by those we are healed and made whole. And I believe not just healing in your body, but emotional and physical, neurological. I believe that our God is faithful to his word. It goes on, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has made to light upon him, Jesus, the guilt and iniquity of us all. Now listen to this. He was oppressed. Yet, when he was afflicted, he was submissive, and he opened not his mouth. It says, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shears is dumb, mute, doesn't say a thing. Not one objection did he give. Ah, I don't deserve this. No, he was mute, silent the whole time. He did not object because he was was on a mission. He was taking our place. It says, so he opened not his mouth. I want you to hear this today. He didn't open his mouth then so that today you could raise your voice. Let boldness rise inside of you. He was silent. He bore it all so that we could lift our voice. The last thing I'm going to say is in Numbers 23, and then we're just going to get loud in for a second if that's okay, because I believe there's going to be some breakthrough in this place. Numbers 23, it's a story of um, a man named Balaam. I'm just snotty. So if you're two, we're together in this. It's coming out of every orifice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's how it should be at women's conference, I feel. Um, There's a guy named Balaam, and he is a verbal assassin, so to speak. So he is hired by people to curse and to bless, mostly to curse. And there was a leader who opposed God's people, Israel. And the leader said, you know what? I want them cursed. I want them to carry some weight. I want them to suffer. I want them destroyed. I would like you to kill and make sure that all their stuff is stolen. So he hired Balaam to go and stand on a mountain and curse God's people. The first time, he couldn't do it. And the guy was like, listen, I'm paying you money, brother. You know what I mean? 
You better do what I'm, I'm asking you to do. He takes him up to another one. And these are the words that Balaam said. He said, behold, I have received a command to bless. I have received a command to bless. I know you hired me to curse, but I've received a command to bless. When he, talking about God, has blessed something, then I cannot revoke it. What God blesses, the enemy cannot revoke. It goes on and it says, He has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. Now, I want to remind, me, remind you, these were humans we were talking about. Was there probably misfortune and trouble and sin? Mm, probably, because they were red-blooded. But here's the deal. In that time, they were walk, walking and living under a covering of grace based on the temporary sacrifices. We now are under a covering of grace based on an eternal sacrifice. So this scripture applies to us. He says this. Balaam continues on and he says, The Lord, his God, is with him, these people. And the shout of the king is among them. What does that mean? Does that mean like he heard God yelling? No, right there that means, that word shout, means that there was a shout, a lifting of their voice, a sign of jubilation that declared that our king is the victor. Our king is the one who reigns. Our king is gonna see us through. Our king says we are blessed. And so you know what? You can't curse us. We are blessed. The shout of the king was among them. It filled the atmosphere. You know that as well as I do, that when we speak the tone of our voice, the sound of our voice, even the facial expressions that we make while we're talking, it changes the atmosphere of the room. And you know what? This is not a verbal battle we're in, okay? I realize that. But when you are talking about the word of God and when it is on your lips, it doesn't change its density. It is still the word of God here. But when you bring it here and it bears witness in your spirit, something supernatural is unlocked. It just is. That's who our God is. And you know, I know I'm stirring up and I'm getting excited, but listen, we need to be speaking of Jesus. Grace has a name and it's Jesus, but he has a sound and it's called your little voice right there. That mouthpiece is the sound of it. That's the sound of the shout of the king. That's the sound of that celebration of praise or that prayer or even songs to be written or even that prayer that you've just been whispering underneath your breath, but you need to just get a little bit loud about it. Or maybe you're just kind of timid to just even, ah, oh, Jesus! You just need to get some freedom. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, will you lift up your hands for a moment with me? Lord, right now, I pray that there would be such a revelation of Jesus in this house, God, that that abundance of your life would come up and overflow out of our mouths, Jesus. We declare that the victory is yours, that the joy of the Lord is our strength, that the women who publish and bear the news of the word are a great and a mighty force in this house. Lord God, that we will declare it. We will not shy back from it. No matter what's on the other side of our doors, no matter is waiting for us tomorrow, Oh God, you know, and we are not alone, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, ladies, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Hallelujah. Jesus. We welcome you into our lives. Lord God, fill our mouths with your praise, with your faith. God, be the author and finisher. Lord God, give us a revelation of you so we can speak boldly, speak loudly, and lift our voice in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.